we'll be talking about that in week three. You have heard of Zoroastrians before. The kings, wise men, astrologers, whoever those guys were, were magi. And magi were Zoroastrians. One of the things that the Zoroastrians believed in was astrology. So naturally, the author of Matthew would have said that the Magi were following a star because the position of stars and planets and all of that uh, determined uh, uh, you know, things, events on Earth. But that's for week three. We're not here to talk about Zoroastrianism today. We're here to talk about Hinduism. So, second thing, a word about uh, sources. My primary source is uh, my World Religions textbook, A History of the World's Religions by David S. Noss. It's, a, it, it, it's really, really good. It's really dense. There's a lot of uh, stuff in it, but it's, it's, it's really good. Um, as we go through these, I'll also pass these around. I happen to have copies, as I know you probably do, I have copies of the Hindu scriptures. So I have the, uh, the, the, the four Vedas, and I have uh, the Upanishads, and I have the Bhagavad Gita. But I will, I will pass those around. Yeah, I know, I know, blah, blah, blah. It, it, old yesterday's news. But uh, I will pass those around as we get to those. So how am I going to approach the major the, the world's religions? What I'm going to try to do is first present these in their historical context. So where did they come from? Religions don't fall out of the sky. They come from human beings. And they come from cultures and societies. And they come from... Uh, some previous religious kind of practices and beliefs, okay? So there's, uh, there's, there's kind of a um, process or an evolution to all of these world religions. They begin in a culture and a society and some kind of, some kind of belief system and some kind of practice, some kind of religious practice, frequently having to do with uh, death, and having to do with um, why are we here and where are we going once we stop living? You know what? What? And, and and how do we how do we make it? How do we survive? How do we get along in this world? Get along in terms of uh, food and survival, uh, survival of the species, uh, survival of the tribe. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's the first phase. And then in the second phase, there is either a founder, in the case of Hinduism, there is no founder, but uh, there is either a founder or a founding event or a founding series of events, okay? Where someone or a, 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 perhaps a, a group of people uh, take a path that's been going this way and take it in a new direction. There's some kind of new insight, there's some kind of new revelation, there's some kind of enlightenment or, or something that happens. And so they take what had been going this way and move it in a different direction. But then, well, so that's phase two. In phase three, there are the followers, the first disciples of the founder or the second generation of believers. And inevitably, Inevitably, without exception, they take what the founder gave them or the, the first generation gave them and they change it. The easiest way to reference it is, you know, whatever Jesus said and did was interpreted by his followers. And they took it in, in several different directions as you now know if you've been here before. There were Gnostic Christians, there were Jewish Christians, there were Greek Christians, you know, the Egyptian Christians. It went in many different directions because everyone interprets what they see and hear 
through the lens of our own minds, the lens of our own experience. There are about 50 of you here this morning. When you leave, there will be 50 different interpretations of what you saw and heard this morning, <laughs> at least. <laughs> and I'll have my own interpretation of what I said and did. So that's the, uh, the, the third phase. And then the fourth phase is just an ongoing evolution. Okay, an ongoing evolution of these uh, religions. And that leads into my first comment about Hinduism. There is an almost infinite diversity of ways to be a Hindu. One of the reasons for that is this evolution of, of, of uh, Hinduism. Another is that the, the culture of Hinduism, or the cultures of, I shouldn't say India, the cultures of India are extremely diverse. Noss, the author of uh, my textbook, says that there is a greater diversity of cultures within India than there is in Europe. When we think of Europe, we think of Italians and Spanish and Germans and Irish and Scottish and you know uh, Flemish and Dutch and all of that. The many cultures of India according to Noss, are even more diverse than that of some place like Europe or Latin America, where we think of diversity, okay? So because of that, there, is, um, th there, is, there are a couple of things. There is a great accommodation to new ideas because there's so many different cultural backgrounds to bounce them off of. So that means there are many, many different ways to be a Hindu. So. A Hindu can be a polytheist, can believe in many, many gods, millions or three or a hundred or whatever. Uh, you can be a monotheist, believe in one god and be a Hindu. You can be uh, an atheist and be a Hindu. You can be a pantheist and believe that God exists in everything. Okay, so there are many, many ways to be a Hindu. That shouldn't be too surprising. There are many, many different ways to be a Christian. You can be a Methodist, a Lutheran, a Catholic, a Baptist, Evangelical, okay? It's true of, of, of uh, most religions. There are only two unchanging rules in the history of, uh, of Hinduism. Rule number one, live by the norms, live by the guidelines of your own caste, your own uh, social class, okay? Hinduism and the caste system are uh, inextricably bound together. They are, they are tied together and have been for eons, okay? There is, an, uh, there is an intrinsic connection between Hinduism in general and the caste system. And second, um, if you do live according to the norms of your own social class, your own caste, then either in your next life, and yes, you will have a next life, they believe in reincarnation, in your next life you will either be better off, okay? I always said, wouldn't it be great in my next life to be Marshall Falk? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't it be cool to be that good at, at football? Um, or if you experience um, liberation, if you experience enlightenment, then you, you, you cease, you cease uh, uh, the, the process of death and rebirth and reincarnation, and you uh, enter into this state of blissful nothingness called nirvana. Okay? So that's by way of introduction. Uh, as I said, I'm going to take a historical look at uh, uh, Hinduism. So I want to begin w way, way back. Um, the, the origins of Hinduism go are, are lost in history. But they go back at least as far as like 2500 BCE. 2500. And before... Uh, Hinduism as even the origins of Hinduism as we know it started there were these a group of people called either uh, Dravidians do I have their name on the note? 
The yeah. Dravidians are they're also called the Dasa people. These were a dark-skinned people. They were the indigenous people of India. They lived around the Indus uh, Valley in central uh, India. Um, th their, their own religious practices included what would end up becoming later on, what would end up becoming the law of karma and the belief in reincarnation. Okay? So we see those two kind of foundational elements in Hinduism way, way, way back, 2500 BCE. But the, 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 the civilization of the Dravidians died out uh, because the climate became inhospitable to, their, uh, to farming. And because of the invasion of a, a, a group of people who are, I think, some of the most fascinating people in history. They are called the Indo-Aryans. I know I have their name on there, right? So around 1800 uh, years before Christ, the Indo-Aryan people uh, who apparently came from Central Asia, for whatever reason known only to them, and they didn't write it down, you know, what's up with that? They began to migrate in two directions. So some of them went into you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Iran. The Iranians are uh, uh, rooted in, uh, in, in Indo, the Indo-Aryan people, and some of them went west. And so Indo-Aryans would later become the Greek people, the Latin people of Italy, uh, the Celtic people, the Germans, the Slavs, and the Iranians. And they would also uh, become uh, it, uh, uh, enculturated into India. So uh, one of the uh, bits of evidence that we have about these Indo-Aryan people is their language. So if you look at um, a word like father, a simple word like father, in, Lat in, 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 uh, in the Indo-Aryan language, that word is pitar, it's spelled P-I-T-A-R. But if you ever took Latin, that same word is pater, P-A-T-E-R. And in German, that word is vater, V-A-T-E-R, and in English, it's father, okay? So, there is a linkage between the, the, the language of these Indo-Aryans in India, and the Latin language, and the German language, and the English language. It's the same with uh, mother. In India, it's matar, M-A-T-A-R. In Latin, it's mater. In German, it's mutter. And in English, it's mother. So these people have had quite an influence on, on world history. Had you ever heard of them before? The Indo-Aryans? Okay. In a bad context. Bad context? Oh, oh, okay. It, it's also, a little, little side note, now I'm jumping ahead to Judaism. It is possible that the people of Abraham around the year 1800 BCE left Mesopotamia because of the invasion of the Indo-Aryans? Possible? Okay. All right, so over, uh, uh, over time, these Indo-Aryans, you know, uh, th they were nomads, they were wanderers, they eventually settled down and they became villagers and farmers and herders, and they uh, struggled with these Dravidian people, or, or Dasa people. The Indo-Aryans were taller and light-skinned people. So if you notice, uh, you know, uh, of Indian people, some are darker, and smaller and lighter skin. I mean, there's a great variation, just as there is in uh, Latin America, just as there is more and more in this country. And the same thing happened in, in India. So they uh, would end up changing the religion of the Dravidians, but the religion of the Dravidians would also change them and their religions. Okay, their religion. So there was this this interaction. 
It was the uh, Indo-Aryans who created the first scripture of Hinduism, the Vedas. The most uh, important of the four Vedas, and I have the pages marked here, so you can you know, flip through and take a look at some of the Vedas, and then you can tell your friends at the next party, yeah, well, when I was uh, uh, leafing through the uh, Vedas, I was really struck with book two, you know, hymn number seven. You know, you, you're familiar with that one, right? You know, and then take a sip from your wine glass. Be, be, be very impressive. So, um, the, the four Vedas are the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, the Yajur Veda, and the Atharva Veda. And even now, all Hindu sects recognize the Vedas as being authentic scriptures. So I'm going to start passing that around and help yourself take a look. But the one I want to focus on is the Rig Veda. It's the one that has had the most uh, influence on the Vedic religion, and that's the first uh, phase. That's that, you know, kind of founding or, or, or founder or founding event. There is no founder, but the, the founding event was the evolution of Hinduism through these people. So the Rig Veda is a collection of religious poetry. There are over a thousand poems in ten books, and they were collected over a, a, a series of several centuries. These hymns and prayers are directed to their gods who are called divas. Okay? Diva in Latin translates into Deus. The thing is, the word diva, which means God in the Indo Aryan language, would also be flipped uh, into the word devil. Okay, its meaning would be flipped into, into devil, the, the, the source of evil and not the source of, of goodness, interestingly enough. So the, uh, the main thing I want to talk about in terms of the Rig Veda is its description of the liturgy, the worship service of these Indo-Aryans, these v Vedic people, I want to call them, because now we're talking about uh, a, a people in terms of their religion. So what does this Vedic relig uh, worship service look like? It's outdoors. There is no building, there is no temple where this takes place. It's on a, a plain of grass. It was held either, and, and they have found these, these, these places, some of these places. There's either a cleared space for the sacrifice or there was an altar. One of the key components of this worship service was fire. There were one, two, or three fires built as part of this service. Hold on to the thought of fires for our discussion of Zoroastrianism because the Zoroastrians will borrow the fire from uh, the Vedic people. So th there were um, seats reserved for the deities in case they happened to show up. And there was food prepared for the gods in case they decided to show up. Because, you know, if they showed up and there was no place for them to sit down, you don't want to make the gods angry, right? Don't do that. So there were offerings made, offerings of either butter or grain or some kind of animal, a goat, sheep, cow, ox, horse. And there was also the passing around or the drinking of a hallucinogenic liquid called soma. Okay? Yeah. Uh, it, it was, uh, apparently, it would, uh, you know, throw you into another state of consciousness pretty quickly. So, um, the, the other thing about the service is that it, w it could last, think about this, the next time you think the homily is going too long. <laughs> this Vedic worship service could last a whole day. It could last 24 hours. Okay, so obviously the Vedic people missed the football games on Sunday afternoons, right? Because they were in church, or they were not in church, they were out on the plain. The main priest, the main celebrant of this worship service uh, became known as the Brahmin, B-R-A-H-M-I-N. You're going to hear that word often because the word either Brahman or Brahmin has multiple meanings. 
And there was the uh, uh, pronouncing of the sacred word, or the sacred words, words which were the Brahman. So the Brahman speaks the Brahman, okay? The sacred prayer to the gods. One of the things that, that translated from Vedic religion to Christianity, believe it or not, was that the, the sacred words had to be spoken exactly right. The syllables had to be exactly correct. And so uh, in the days of the Latin Mass, well, the Latin Mass is still here, but when the priest especially would speak the words of consecration, it was important that those words be spoken exactly right. Hoc est enum corpus meum. Okay? Uh, and and uh, that is a holdover from uh, the, the, the religion of the Latins, the religion of the Romans, which came from the Indo-Aryans. Okay? So even our own religion has ties to, to these people. Along with the worship service, the Vedas, the Rig Veda, um, it has a, a, a certain mythology, or if you will, a theology to it. All right? So, um, this uh, sacrifice, which, it, which was part of the worship service, <coughs> became part of their, their uh, theology of creation. And so there were several different stories about how the universe was created, and many, or maybe even all of them, involved some kind of sacrifice. Okay? So there were, there were stories that the, uh, the universe was formed when some kind of cosmic horse or cow was dismembered. And the horse's hooves became mountains, and the horse's mane became rivers, and all of that. Okay. So that was, you know, so a, a horse or a cow is sacrificed in order to create the universe. There is another uh, myth within the Rig Veda that talks about the first man. No, his name is not Adam. His first, his name is Parusha. And the story has it, the myth has it, that the universe was created because Purusha sacrificed himself to the gods. Okay? He allowed himself to be sacrificed. And here's a brief description. This is in the Rig Veda. When they divided Purusha, how many portions did they make? The Brahman was his mouth. Of both his arms was the Rajanya made. His thighs became the Vaisya. From his feet, the Shudra was produced. The moon was gendered from his mind, and from his eye, the sun had birth. Forth from his navel came midair. I didn't write it. The, the sky was fashioned from his head, earth from his feet. So this stuff about uh, the Kshatriya, the Rajanya, the Vaisya, the Shudra, those are the original castes. Those are the original social classes. So you notice the, 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 uh, the caste system was framed in terms of creation itself. Okay? Uh, that why? Because the Indo-Aryans used the caste system to keep themselves at the top of the social order. Mm -hmm. They were at the top. Yeah, Don. Can you spell that? Parusha. Parusha. P-A-R-U-S-H-A. So then there was still another creation myth in the Rig Veda. There's, there are several. I mean, there's, what the heck? There's two creation myths within the book of Genesis. There are several creation myths within the Rig Veda. This other creation myth says that there was this deity named Vishvakarman, and he created the world by being both the priest and the victim of a cosmic sacrifice. When I hear those words, isn't that just amazing? Because, 
you know, Christian theology views Christ as both priest and priest and victim, you know. But it's different. It's not, and there's not a one-for-one -one match there. But there is, you know, there is a, a, an interesting confluence of at least the idea. All right. So who? there were three major gods, three major divas, deities within the Rig Veda. One is Dios Pitar, who is Father Sky. Dios Pitar in Greek mythology is Zeus Pater. And in Roman mythology is Jupiter. Okay? Um, his mate is called Prithivi Matar, Mother Earth, or in Greek, Gaia Mater, and the third is Mithra, or Mitra. We might be able to talk about at some points the, the, the cult of Mithra, which uh, competed with early Christianity, was condemned by early Christianity. I don't remember where it is in my notes, but it's in there somewhere. Okay, so then there are the other Vedas, the Yajur Veda, uh, which uh, is, a, is a group of, uh, of prayers and litanies uh, that, went, that, were, that accompanied the, this worship service. The Sama Veda are uh, hymns that were used at the worship service, and the Atharva Veda is a series of charms and spells and blessings and curses and rituals uh, for uh, not so much for the Indo-Aryans but for the common people who were not part of the Indo-Aryan uh, race. Okay. So that's the very earliest record that we have of Hinduism and, and, and actually the, the Vedic religion, the Vedic form of Hinduism could, can, should really be considered pre-Hindu. But we have to talk about it because it led to the phase which we can call Hinduism proper, Hinduism per se. So at some point, the Vedic priests turned their attention away from the worship service and began to look more inward and became more contemplative and more meditative. Okay? And that is a key turning point in the history of, of Hinduism. What the question that they began to reflect on more and more was is there a God? Is there a principle? Is there a life force that is the source of everything? We wonder about that, right? The, the God who is the source of everything is our God, right? <coughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Indo-Aryans, or the Vedic, I should say, the Vedic priests began to wonder about the same thing. Where did it all come from? Is there a single principle or God or life force that is the source of everything? Page 90. <coughs> then there was neither being nor non-being. There was no air, nor firmament beyond it. Was there a stirring? Where? Beneath what cover? Was there a great abyss of unplumbed water? There was no death, nor anything immortal, nor any sign dividing day from night. That one thing, that's what they named this life source, this uh, source of everything. That one thing, breathing no air, was yet self-breathing. No second thing existed whatsoever. Does that make does that make some kind of sense? So what they're what they're saying 
is that before there was anything else, before the world existed, there was this God, this life principle, which is called that one thing. In their language, Tatvam Asi. And uh, out of that one thing came everything else. That's not too foreign to us. Out of the mind of God came the universe in our Christian way of thinking, right? So they're thinking along the same lines. They just named it differently. Um, all right, so then that leads us into the next phase. And I'm going to walk through this slowly because uh, it's, let's just say it's complicated. As if it weren't complicated enough already, all right? Allow me to complicate things even more. So, uh, the second phase of, of uh, the evolution of Hinduism is Brahmanist Hinduism. And I think I have that there. Okay. And now we're at, at about the 6th century before Christ. We are about the same time as the Babylonian exile in the history of Judaism. We are... Uh, around the time of uh, Aristotle or Plato or just maybe a few years before that, all right, just to put it in some kind of historical context. So what happened? What happened in this second phase? Thing number one was the hardening or the, the formalizing of the caste system. Um, Kind of uh, sadly, the word for caste originally was varna. And the word varna literally translates into color. So uh, the, the social uh, strata went from those who were lighter skinned to those who were darker skinned. Today they don't use the word varna. The, the word for caste is jati. Uh, but anyway, be that as it may, uh, let, let's take a look at, at these different social classes, these different social stratas, strata. First were the Brahmins. These are the priestly class. All of them are Aryans. Uh, when I say Aryans, I'm not talking about what Hitler was talking about when he was talking about the Aryans, okay? <laughs> Nor am I talking about the followers of Arius, the priest who challenged uh, whether Jesus was divine or not. This is the Indo-Aryans. Okay. Um, it was the Brahmins who had power over the sacred prayer, that Brahman that I just described a few minutes ago. They, their uh, primary responsibility was to offer the sacrifice and the sacred prayers, okay? And they believed that they could influence the course of human events through their prayers and through conducting the worship service, okay? Mark, the, yes? Can they come from any of the other classes below that? No. If, you know, so we'll see that reincarnation also comes around at this time if you were one of these lower classes, or an untouchable, or an outcast, or anything like that, you had to go through several lifetimes to kind of go up the, up the ladder. Okay? Uh, yeah. So it was, it, it was good to be a Brahmin. Can you go down the ladder? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. I'll, I'll, I'll get into how you can go down the ladder in a little bit. In fact, you could be uh, one of the... Uh, one of the lower classes, you know, in this life, and come back as a um, as an ox or a, a lizard. I mean, you are a plant. I mean, if you were really a bad boy, you can <laughs> you can come back as poison ivy or something. I guess. So that so the top class are the Brahmins. The second tier are the Kshatriyas. They are the political ruling class. So the Brahmins are the religious ruling class. The Kshatriyas are the political ruling class. Also, all Aryans. See what's happening here? The third are the Vaisyas. These are the, the common people. These are farmers. These are craftspersons, that kind of thing. So now we have 
a, a, a mixture of Aryans and non-Aryans. The fourth are the Shudras, and they are the servant class. The servant class are all non-Aryans, and eventually there, there came to be hundreds, even thousands of sub-castes and sub-classes. Some of them are, you know, they're considered uh, outcasts, which, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a double meaning there. They're outside the caste system. It doesn't mean they're, but they were also outcasts without the E. They are the so-called dregs of society. And there were also those who were considered untouchable. They were uh, impure. All right? That caste system continues even today in <laughs> India. It's breaking down somewhat. And the, one of the primary, one of the prime movers of the elimination of the caste system was Gandhi. But it, it hasn't been that long ago. Okay. At this early period, intermarriage between castes was strictly forbidden. I'm sure it still happened, human beings being who they are. But it, it was, you know, it was, it was strictly forbidden. If you were a member of this caste, you could not marry someone outside your own class. Yeah, Ken. What's to keep me from like putting on a different set of clothes and saying? <laughs> I'm a guy, you know. Probably nothing, you know. Yeah, you know. So you skip to the next village, you know, right. and say, "No, I'm not one of them. I'm one of these." I'm sure it happened, but not everybody was as clever as you. <laughs> I, I would never have thought of that, Ken. I would have, yeah. but you know, there were there was a strict prohibition against <clears throat> claiming. You, know, you, if you wanted to come back. As uh, you know, as a higher in a higher caste in your next life, your your job was to live according to the norms of the caste that you are in in this life, and that's how you accumulated good karma. Good. Uh, let me let me stop right here and say karma is not the principle that what goes around comes around. That is not karma. Okay. Uh, karma is, uh, is really, uh, I guess the word I would use is merit. If you live according to the, the norms of your caste, if you're a shudra, if you're a servant, and you're a good servant, then maybe next time you can move up the ladder. So there was a religious prohibition, you know, uh, or, or, or taboo against claiming that you were a member of uh, a caste that you weren't. Yeah, so you, you said they can't marry, this, in my interest, you said they can't marry between classes, so that implies then that, let's say, in the Brahmin class, there was a position for women with the female priests? Uh, no, there were not female priests, but there, the, uh, the women, a, a, as you'll see, I'll, I'll talk about this in just a little while. Sorry. The, the, the job of the women was to serve their man. So, you know, you see, what you can see here is classism and sexism that is hardened by, you know, religious belief. Not the first, not the only time that's happened, but <laughs> but it certainly happened in. So there, so there were women in the Brahmin class, but they just couldn't hold a position. They, that's right. They were born into that class. They were born into that caste. Yeah. What they had to do, think about it for a second. What would you have to do if you were a Brahmin woman? You would have to take care of your, your man, and then if you, if you did that well, you might be able to come back as a Brahmin male. And, and yeah, and reach, and reach the mountaintop. <laughs> yeah, Ken. Were, were they evangelical? I mean, as far as like, Proselytizing, trying to get other people in his followers. No, no, uh, they were not a uh, they were not an evangelical missionary religion. They, you know, and, and I think part of it was because um, the, the the caste system was so hardened. You know, uh, think think about Judaism. Judaism really is not a missionary religion because. You know, uh, for 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 many Jews, not all, you are born into you know Judaism. 
is both a religion and it's an ethnicity and all that. So, no, they did. Buddhism did become a missionary religion. Hinduism did not. Hinduism or Buddhism grew out of Hinduism. Buddhism became a missionary religion where Hinduism did not. And that's why most Hindus, you know, are from India. How many other religions were in the area at this time? Was 90% of the population? I mean, like, yeah. if, if you even believed in a different religion, if you were Jewish, were you considered part of the caste system and treated such anyway? You, there, uh, if there were any Jews in India, and, there, and they probably were, they were probably just excluded from the whole, you know, however few there may have been, they would have been excluded from the caste that, system. Uh, of the total population, how many were actually Hindus? Well, um, that's a good question. It, those in charge, those at the top of the, of the heap, would have considered everybody to be part of the caste system, and treated, so. and treated as such. Those, you know, out in the out in the villages and whatever, well, we will see that there there was always a kind of a popular religion that 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 went on, you know, outside of this formal Brahmanist thing. The 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 Brahmanist religion was pretty much the religion of the elites. And we'll see this meditation and contemplate. Well, most people don't have the time to spend hours in meditation. You got to go out and till the field, right? You got to keep your family alive. So there has always been uh, in Hinduism and in many of the other world religions as well, this kind of contemplative mystical elite and then the rest of the folks who practice their religion much differently. That, does that help? Well, I just wonder if in the history of India, with them being one of the most diverse collection of cultures matched, yeah. when did that happen? If, oh, you know. okay, so, uh, I think it w uh, was always that way. So there are, um, look at Europe, there are different tribal people, Germans and Franks and you know Slavs and all that. Same thing was true in India. And so, you know, the, uh, Bra Brahmanism originated in central India in the Indus Valley. So it didn't just, you know, all of a sudden become the religion of, of all of India. It would have spread as people migrated from one place to another. Okay? I, I'm probably not doing, I, I'm not doing it justice because I'm talking about things that take centuries of, you know, uh, intermarriage and all of that to, to, to evolve. Yeah. Yeah, Ken. Is the Dalai Lama Hindu? No, he's no, Buddhist. No. But he lives in India. But he lives in India because the Chinese kicked him out of Tibet. Okay. Yeah. That's next week, Ken. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. That's a <laughs> fair question. <laughs> like chapter. See you next week. Chapter two, yeah. All right, so. Um, There's a question back there, Mark. Yes, yes. How did we decide, or how did they ever decide that light skin was higher? Yeah. Was meant to be higher in the cast? It was the light skinned people who were in, in control. Right, but was there ever a reason why? It, I mean, was it just a lottery? <laughs> or we have no idea why dark skin was in order? It was an assertion of power, it was an assertion of control, and it worked. It still works. It yeah. still works. You're saying there was really no reason. No, no, it's something. It's something where the light-skinned people. Remember, the light-skinned people were the ones who conducted the service, the right. worship How service. Were they it could have been the dark Could have been, but it just so happened that in history, it was the light-skinned people who asserted their control, and and it worked. People bought it. You know, if people buy it, it, it works, right? In India now, the they still they're they you know how in Western culture we all want to go outside and get sun and look tan. Yeah. In the Indian, I'm saying Indian culture, but in India, their top selling uh, 
like makeup and all that kind of stuff is to lighten your skin. They lighten try the skin. And, they still try and bleach their skin even to this day. The same is true in much of uh, Latino yeah. culture, where there is a, a, prefer a, a preference for light, lighter skin tone than darker. One of those strange, you know, things about history. Yeah, David. Uh, is this invasion by Indo Aryans another way to describe an invasion by the Mongols? It's not the Mongols. I mean, I mean, it's it's it, the only similarity is that it is an invasion. The Mo the Mongols were later and came out of uh, Mo Mongolia. Okay, these people came out of, let's say, uh, Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan. You know, more yeah, closer to the Caspian Sea. Where's my map? I don't have my map today. Did the Mongols affect the Brahmin class at all? I don't think so. They went. They went. They went west. I don't think they ever invaded the India. They went. East. No, they went west. They went from Mongolia. They they made it all the way to, to Europe. Well, in one foray, but in the other, they went across the Bering. Oh, across the Bering Strait, but yeah, in both directions. Yeah. Yes. So does that? Yeah, the Mongols, or the Mongols are, are, are uh, if my sense of history is right, are later than these people. Yes. Quite a bit later than these people. Well, I was just wondering to what extent they were involved in I don't think at all, to tell you the truth. I don't think so. Yeah. It sounds somewhat like a feudal system, <coughs> where you have yeah. the, the lords and the, all the way down to the untouchables. Yes. The beggars, the... Yes. It's a, it's a class system. The thing is, it was absolutely firmed up, legitimized, and hardened by religious belief. And you throw in the belief in reincarnation and karma, you know, so you're in a lower caste. Your life mission is to live according to the rules of your caste, and maybe next time, you'll be able to rise up to Donna's cast. Or even better, Jim's, because he's a male. But all the time they're laughing and saying, we're just making our power over so you just do what you're supposed to do, and you're never going anywhere. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, what we're saying, the Brahmin made up the rules. The rest of them just followed. That's exactly yeah. right, Lee. Yeah. The, Brahmins, the Brahmins made the rules, and they made it stick. They made the rules stick. People went along. They bought it. For all these centuries. For centuries. Literally for centuries. Yes. So the rituals, the rituals changed. Okay. So rituals became um, more uh, the 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 the, uh, the purview of of common people, where they would do these either in public or at home. So you had. R rituals at harvest time, the full moon, the beginning of spring, the rainy season, the fall, you know, the coronation of kings, all that kind of stuff. And then you also had uh, the rites in the home, rituals in the home. Morning offerings, evening offerings, monthly offerings, you know, to the gods and things like that. So there always was, you know, the, the common people would not come to these fire rituals. That was for the... the the upper crust, but the the common folks, uh, you know, would have their own public rituals, private rituals, you know, things like that. the uh, The scriptures of this Brahmanist period are the Upanishads, and the Upanishads reflect a shift in thinking, at least among the Brahmanists, from ritual worship you know that fire service to meditation and contemplation and the question that they're reflecting on is this what can we do what can human beings do to escape the suffering of this world and achieve true bliss true liberation true happiness we ask ourselves that question. That's not, a, that's not a totally foreign question. You know, how often do we say, 
you know, man, I can hardly wait till the next thing when I won't have all these aches and pains and all of that, right? And all the, the hardship that comes with it. Okay. So they're, they're searching for, you know, some kind of ultimate reality. Okay. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. So let me, I'm going to try to explain this as best I can. So... Step one, there is this shift toward contemplation, meditation, mysticism, if you will, okay? And so when people engage in contemplation and meditation, they are trying to think about uh, ultimacy. They're, trying, they're thinking about where did this all come from and where is all of this going, okay? They're thinking philosophically. They're thinking about how is the universe, how does the universe work? How does this whole universe actually work? Uh, and so there, there's two phases to this. In the first phase, there is this belief in a distinction between the world within me, the world within the self, and the world outside the self. Okay? The philosophers call that dualism. Simply a print, you know, belief that there's two principles. So there is the world, there is the world inside me, my soul, myself, and the world outside me. That's kind of intuitive, isn't it? <coughs> It's easy to think about there's a world that goes on inside of me and there's a whole world out there that goes on outside of me. Okay? So there are two things. So in that framework, the way to escape suffering is to get away from this material world, this uh, world around us, and to free the world, to, to free myself, to free my inner self for the spiritual world. It sounds a lot like uh, the, the philosophy of Plato. It sounds a lot like the, the, the Gnostic spirituality, okay? That the goal of life is to escape suffering by escaping this material body and this material world. Somehow this material body and this material world bring only suffering and hardship. So I need to, to focus on the world of spirit and escape from this, this world of materiality and suffering. There's a lot of spirituality that goes in that direction, isn't there? There's a lot of spirituality that moves in, moves in that direction. So there's no war. I mean, they're not thinking of Christ or no. Jesus or anything like that in this environment. No, that's a good question, Lee. There's, it's not like I'm going to heaven. It's I'm escaping the, the, the world, the material world of suffering, and I can, I can escape it already in this life through meditation. I can find my true spiritual self within and overcome the world of, the material world of suffering. Okay? Before I die, I can be enlightened. One of the reasons why this is hard for uh, us to grasp is because our religion, Christianity, is not a religion of enlightenment as much as it is a religion of revelation. So, you know, Christianity is a revealed religion. In other words, God came to earth in the form of the man Jesus and revealed God to us from outside. Hinduism says that we discover um, the ultimate reality. We discover God, if you will. We discover happiness from within. So it's very individualistic in that sense. See the difference? In Christianity, it comes from outside. In Judaism, in Islam, it comes from outside. In Hinduism and Buddhism, it comes from within. But you can make yourself as happy as you want inside. Sooner or later, you've got to go to the store and get something, and you're, you're dealing with the outside. Oh, absolutely. But even when you're going to the store, 
you're still in this, you can be in this state of bliss because you have overcome, even though you live in the material world, you have overcome the material world. All right, so that's phase one. Now here's phase, here's, yeah, Mike. Aren't there some mystics in Catholicism that live on the Eucharist alone? Oh yeah, absolutely. There is a, so there is a strain of mysticism in Catholicism, in uh, Islam. It would be a complete uh, achievement of this objective where... Yeah, uh, they have achieved, they have found bliss. They have had a direct experience of God. Most of us are not mystics. Most of us cannot claim to have a direct experience of God. Our experience of God is indirect. It's mediated. It's mediated by the Eucharist. It's mediated by the scripture. It's mediated by the priest. It's mediated by the people of God, by the congregation. Mystics have a direct experience of God. But, and there are mystics in Christianity. There are mystics in Judaism, but they are a small minority. Brahmanist Hinduism is, is, uh, is founded on everybody finding that moment of enlightenment. And until we do, until we have that moment of enlightenment, we keep dying and being reborn. Because we don't yet get it. The fundamental error that people commit, according to Brahmanist Hinduism, is an error in the way that we think. That we think wrongly. We think there is a self within and a self outside of us. And that's my perfect segue into this next phase of Brahmanist thinking. The, the next phase involved this, that the world outside, it, within the self and the world outside the self are not two, not two different things, but one. In other words, Everything, everything in the universe, the body, the soul, everything, all is one. Now that's, we, we, don't, we don't think that way instinctively. And I can, in other words, we are by instinct and by training dualists. We are not, what I'm talking about here, to say that everything is one, that all is one, is called, and I, I don't know if I have the word down there or not, monism, M-O-N-I-S-M, okay? And monistic thinking is contrary to uh, our, our way of thinking. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna Nick, I'm gonna use you as my uh, guinea pig for this. So, uh, Dick, what will happen when you die? I will go to heaven. Uh, what, do you need, what, do you, what do you need I? I know you will, but what do you need I? My soul and body. You're a dualist. Because the body will stay here and the soul will go somewhere else. Okay? You are not a monist. There's nothing wrong with that, but you're not a monist. Okay? Monism says this. Monistic Brahmanist thinking says this. That everything, everything in the universe is one. There is no difference between me and you, me and this ultimately. And so there is this illusion, there is this illusion of individuality. I, I think that I am distinct from everything else. I think that I exist outside of everyone and everything else, but I don't. I am, this is the analogy that they use, I am like a drop of water in the ocean. So momentarily I exist as this drop of, of water. But eventually, when I understand that I am but a drop of water in the ocean, then I go back into the ocean and I lose me, and that's, that's what happens. I, I am not an individual, but I am the ocean. Nothing to it, right? It's why Jesus could walk on water, but when Peter tried it, he couldn't. Peter was dualistic and Jesus was uh, Jesus probably was a, a, a monist. I, I, the analogy is, uh, you know, there's a little bit of an analogy there, but, you know, to, to, yeah, go ahead. And then his uh, transfiguration on the mile. 
when his when his face shone as the sun, mm -hmm. you know, and his garments were illuminated from within or uh, to the outside, yeah. making them whiter than any polar could make them. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, though, like he could, Christ walk, he could walk through walls. Yeah, for the most part, though, Christianity does not espouse monism. There are some Christians who are, are monists, but it's it's rare. Most Christians are dualists because we have you know we, 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 we think in terms of body and spirit. We do we do think in terms of a material world and a spiritual world, and that and that they are not the same. It's where everybody starts. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, the, you know, and we also me, me. Christians Christians also don't. Uh, uh, espouse reincarnation either. That this is it. This is our time. Right. This is our moment. And after this, we go on to the next life, eternal life, whatever that may be. So but my, this is not what they. This right. A Hindu would order a pizza by saying, "Make me one with everything." Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's yeah. That's my only Hindu joke. What did the what did, what did the Hindu say to the hot dog vendor? Right, make me one with everything. Yeah. So yes, that is <laughs> yours is better than mine. I like that. So is there death? Is yes. Is there death? There is death. Yes. So. Here's what happens. So as long as I do not understand that I am one with all, that I am a drop of water in the ocean, as long as I don't get that and I continue to live with the illusion that I am an individual, there I will continue on the, the, this wheel, wheel of being, which is actually on the flag of India, and return. I will. There will. There. Uh, uh, I, I. I will die and be reborn again. Be reborn again until I understand. Until I am enlightened. Until I am liberated. Until I am freed from the illusion of my individuality. And once I experience that, this is what uh, they call moksha. M o k s h a. That's enlightenment, liberation, salvation, if you will. So liberation and salvation, freedom take place in this life. Yeah. So as long as long as I don't get it, as long as I continue to think wrongly, I will con I will continue to die and be reborn. It's only when I understand the truth that I am not an individual, that I am one with everything in the universe, that I am, am free. Then I am happy. Then I uh, uh, have found bliss. Then I'm ready to move on to that final state called nirvana, which is a state of both existence and non-existence. Yeah, the, 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 Indian, the Indian people uh, are far more tolerant of paradox than we are. It's a state of existence and non-existence. So I exist, but not as, not as I. I exist as that drop of water in the ocean. I am the ocean. It's difficult. So is that their answer to all things are made of matter and matter never goes away and you have to put the matter somewhere so we're going to put it in the next life so that it's still matter? So it's well, yeah, they, they, like they will say, they, they will say that, the, that the, the material universe is, is eternal. Okay? okay? And so that it's just, it's just here. And that we, you know, we are we are one with the material world. We are one with it. The material world is part of the ocean too. You can't. The creation story we're made of it. So. Yeah, in our creation yes, story. Yes, in our creation. Story. Yeah, in their creation story, not so much. 
it's just a, this is where Hindu this is where Brahmanist Hinduism is so different. It's so different from the way that we think. But as we'll see in, in the next uh, phase of evolution of Hinduism, uh, this is not the only way to be a Hindu. Okay, in fact, this is kind of the way of the elites because, like I said before, most people don't have the time to sit there and meditate for, for hours and years at a time. Okay, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say it one more time. We, we begin with the thought that I am, there is the world within me, that I am an individual, and there is this whole world that exists outside of me. As long as I do that, I am in error. My thinking is in error. Once I am enlightened, once I come to the realization of the truth that I am not an individual, that everything in the universe is one and not two, then I am free. Then I have experienced moksha, liberation, freedom, salvation, deliverance. Okay? And when I die after that enlightenment, then I enter into this state of both existence and non-existence. I no longer exist as I. I exist only as part of the all. Us. All. And not just us. All. The everything. The physical universe. All of us. Yeah. Well, us and it. Yeah. We are. Yeah. Yeah. But it's more well, than that. It's not it's, it's not people. It's, it's not just I'm people. part of this table. It's I'm the part tree. of the wall. I'm part of the tree. Mm -hmm. It's it's us and it. Yeah, I am one. I am one with this podium. I am becoming one with this water. <laughs> um, okay, so then let me. So, so I, that's the hardest part of this to understand, obviously. <clears throat> so then I've already alluded to this, but then the law of karma uh, comes about and is formalized during this Brahmanist phase. So, what we, the law of karma says that what we do in this life determines what we will be in the next life. So, what is a, a, a good life? A good life is living t according to the rules of the caste that you're born into. You see how socially controlling and stultifying that is for people? If I'm born as a, as a slave, that is my lot. That is my fate in this life. And if I am a good slave, then... In the next life, I'll be something better. That's, I mean, that's, yeah, all right. So the law of karma, in effect, gave this, the caste system, moral justification. Okay? Um, what else? All right, so I've already talked about moksha and nirvana. Now let's talk about the later evolution of Brahmanist Hinduism. So we've had the Vedic phase. We've had the Brahmanist phase, and now this third phase where of, as I described at the beginning, of this branching out, this further evolution of Hinduism. So, um, Hindu, uh, Brahmanist Hinduism eventually became, you know, uh, um, not impossible, but very difficult to... Uh, grasp and, and to carry out for most people. So Hinduism had to adapt. It either had to adapt or it would die. And especially it needed to, to offer something to everyday people, ordinary people who don't have the time and willingness to do all that meditation and contemplation. So there evolved 
not one, but three ways of salvation, three ways of moksha, three ways of liberation. Okay? The first one is called karma marga, the way of works. I think that's on there. Should be on there. Okay. So the way of works, our karma marga, emphasizes rituals. This is the way to experience moksha. This is the way to experience deliverance, not the, the realization that I am not an individual and that I am one with everything. But rather, if I carry out the rituals, especially these home rituals correctly, then I can experience deliverance. Um, well, that, performing the rituals, and also uh, accumulating good karma, living according to the, the norms of my caste. Those are the two requirements. Perform the rituals, live according to the rules of your caste. And even now, this is the way of the overwhelming majority of people in India. This is the, this is the practice. This is the way they practice Hinduism. Um, th th there are sacrifices. We're returning here to sacrifices to the gods and to the ancestors. Uh, the, 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 the ritual fire returns in this, this form of Hinduism. Um, there are rituals associated with birth and marriage and death, the harvest, those kinds of things. All right? Okay, so that's the first one. The second uh, way is through meditation, the way of knowledge. That's traditional Brahmanist Hinduism, okay? Its scripture is the Upanishads, which is making its way around. Its base is, I've already said, on the belief that the, uh, the cause of our misery, the cause of our suffering, is our ignorance. Our ignorance of who we really are. That what we really are is not an individual, but we are one with the all, that we are one with everything. And so if we continue to act as an individual over and against the world, or outside of the world, or that, then we will never find happiness or deliverance or bliss. There are actually six schools of the way of knowledge. I'm not going to talk about all six of them. Okay, there are six schools of it. As I said, Hinduism is very, very diverse. So there are six schools of the way of knowledge. The most well-known is this monistic school that I've already described to you. Okay? Uh, which says that our individuality is an illusion. As long as we continue to think of ourselves as a separate self, then we remain caught in this cycle of death and, and continuous rebirth, which is called samsara. I think, I hope I have samsara in there somewhere. The only um, parallel I can think of in Christianity is the theology of marriage. What does, what is involved in the theology of marriage? The two shall become one flesh. That, that, that two individuals become one by uniting themselves in the bond of marriage. That's the closest thing I can, I can think of in, in Christianity. Although there is a phrase in one of Paul's letters, one of you probably knows what it is, where Paul says that uh, eventually uh, Jesus will hand over the universe to, to God and God will be all in all. Sounds a little bit like this, doesn't it? Yeah, Ken. Well, the church talks about the body of Christ. Yeah, as being one, right? As being one. Yes, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's, a, that's another example of though we are, me though we are many, yeah, we are one. Shoot, even our... Uh, even our, our coinage says, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. But it's not, that's a, you know, 
that's a political reality, not a philosophical reality. But in 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 the body of Christ, yeah, we we are many, and we bring each one brings his or her own particular gifts. But at the end of the day, we are one. We are Christ in the world. So there so there are parallels. There are par some parallels. Yeah, thanks for that. Um. Okay. So I've already described that that one school. I, I've been I've been through that. I'm not going to go through it again. And then there is the third. Uh, way of uh, of uh, moksha, which is bhakti, the way of devotion. This too is is popular in India. It's especially popular with with common people, um, and it involves what it involves is a personal relationship with a particular god or goddess. So you may have your own. God, and you may have your own God, and you may have your own God, and I may have my own. And so, uh, uh, Noah says that there may be as many as 330 million gods and goddesses within the, uh, the Hindu uh, pantheon. But I've heard it described this way uh, by uh, Paul Coutinho, if you've ever heard him speak. Coutinho says that there is one God with 330 million different faces. Yes. Yeah. Okay? So, who knows? Who knows? Uncle Sam. <laughs> yeah. So, the, the path to salvation and liberation is this devotion to your own particular God or goddess. Um, the scripture of this particular form of, of Hinduism is the Bhagavad Gita, translated the Song of the Blessed Lord. And the Bhagavad Gita uh, um, actually endorses all three ways to salvation, but it, it says that the way of devotion is the best one. Um, let me read something from the Bhagavad Gita. This was a passage that was particularly meaningful for uh, Gandhi. Who hateth naught of all that lives, living himself, benign, compassionate, from arrogance, exempt, exempt from love of self, unchangeable by good or ill, who troubleth not his kind and is not troubled by them, clear of wrath, living above all gladness, grief, or fear. That man I love, who unto friend or foe, keeping an equal heart, with equal mind, bears shame and glory. With an equal peace, takes heat and cold, pleasure and pain. Abides, quit of desires, hears praise or calumny in passionless restraint, unmoved by each. That man I love. Is that... So... This, the, this is the person who has found uh, liberation, who has found true happiness, who is unmoved by whatever may come his way or her way, who can walk through life in, in, in peace and in bliss and in happiness, who's not overwhelmed by the suffering of life. Okay, I, 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 I kind of like that quote too. So, <laughs> why um, was he respected so much? Gandhi? Yeah, he was like, he was like a. Oh, yeah, he's still held in very high. Well, uh, I think there, for many things, but two in particular, one, he helped negotiate the, uh, the independence of India from the British. About seven, eight years ago, uh, Gandhi's uh, grandson, Arun Gandhi, came to the shrine. 
Uh, I have I, I have a picture of my own self with with uh, with Arun, Dr. Gandhi, <laughs> and he told the story of how when he was a little boy, he would break into the room where Gandhi, where Grandpa, <laughs> and the British were negotiating, and he'd come and mess up their papers and all that kind of, all that kind of thing. That's a side story, but anyway. Gandhi is known for that. He's also known for uh, his strict adherence to nonviolence. Not, not passive resistance, but nonviolent resistance. Okay? And so his philosophy is, is studied by a lot of people who, you know, want to be uh, peacemakers. He never advocated, you know, raising the, uh, guns against the British or anything like that. So those, yeah, those things. But the thing with Gandhi is he never advocated for it, but he didn't admonish those that did. Yes. Those that did what? That did act violently. He himself said we need to do this through nonviolence, but yeah. he never admonished those he didn't? that no, really? he did not. He very much realized that they were not going to be able to be free of British rule yeah. without someone raising arms. He just did not want to be the person that did that. He didn't that. want to do it. <laughs> I, I did not know that. that thank you. That's, 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 uh, that's my learning for today. Don't do as I say. <laughs> and there, there's a lot of people that do, that they, Gandhi is very much respected because of how he did help negotiate, but there are a lot of people that say that he very much was, uh, uh, I'll let somebody else do the hard work while I sit over here on top of it all. Okay. And, and spin, spin yarn. Yeah, Ken. I don't know where I read this, but anyway, uh, Gandhi uh, said that he would have uh, uh, applied different methods had it been the Nazis. Oh, oh, interesting. Can you read that? Yeah, she didn't hear that. Can you say that again? Never. That he, that he would have, the Gandhi had said that he would have employed different methods had he been in conflict with the Nazis. Never again. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. yeah what I remember about Gandhi is when he was in England, he studied all religions. Yes. Christianity and he came away with a belief, and he, I wouldn't say it was a collection of them, I think it was mostly Hindu, but it was the idea that he was trying very hard to do something at a higher level. Yeah, I, I do recall hearing one time that he said, yeah, that he thought the, he thought the Sermon on the Mount was the, was the most profound religious, you know, uh, religious thing ever, ever, yes. ever written. Yeah, that's why we gained my respect. He really studied all of them. Yeah. And came away with the Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. So I've already mentioned that yeah, the, the polytheism of the uh, of the Bhaktis, and there are a, a number of other religious practices as well. Yeah, getting close to eleven. So there are pilgrimages. Pilgrimage to temples, to streams. There's a huge pilgrimage to the Ganges River once a year. Uh, or, or, or the shrines, there's a number of shrines. Uh, it, it's out of bhakti that we have uh, the, the uh, reverence for the cow, where the cow is not to be killed or touched. Okay, the sacred, the sacred cow. Um, there's uh, beliefs in astrology, divination, all those kinds of things, and, and, and many festivals. I, I, I uh, googled Hindu festivals yesterday and uh, counted 53 of them. So, I mean, if you, I guess if you practice all of them, you'd never go to work, right? Uh, I don't think anybody practices all of them. I, re I had a student one time who did her uh, presentation in my World Religions class on Diwali, the Festival of Lights, which is a, a you could look that up. That's, real, that's really, really beautiful. The lights on the rivers and you know, all that kind of thing. Okay. And then I'll just finish with this, that, you know, there is 
a movement, even though it's slow, to try to dis, you know, to, to dissemble the caste system in India. And, and Gandhi was one of those who was not in favor of it. And I think, you know, there's very practical reasons. It, it, it's, it's holding India as a country uh, back from socially and, and, and economically. So very, very slowly, would you say it's still slow? But well, the interesting thing about it is uh, it is the, the lower castes that are continuing, that are perpetuating it. Mm. So when, you, when you're in the main cities and that kind of stuff, yes, they're still, but it's... But not the countryside. And as you, and as you become more economically diverse, it yeah. kind of is not as of a big of a deal. But yeah. you get out into the poor villages, and it is very much their way of life. Yeah, yeah. And that doesn't surprise me too much. Yeah. I mean, that's where you see the honor killings is in the villages. Yeah. So Tell they're happy with the cat system? Yes. Um, not, necessarily, not necessarily happy, happy with it, but the, accepted. What, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So know. that means there's no moving forward. Right? As they become more economic, as, uh, the middle class becomes bigger, it is diluting the caste system somewhat, but it's going to take a while. Because it is such a very, uh, it is a country of haves and have-nots. Yeah, oh yeah. It's still pretty pretty it pervasive. Is, yeah. I mean, and even middle class there is, I mean, I've been there like 10 times, that's why I'm talking about it, but um, we, when I take people there, for work, yeah. Um, I'll tell you, it, it is. It's culture shock the first time you go. Their middle class is probably abject poverty here in the United States, but it is middle class there. Yes, that's true in many other yeah. parts of the world. Yeah. By the way, Mark, isn't that that thing? I thought that was Burma or bulls, not a cow. Is it, is it the bull? That no, it's a cow. It's a cow. You cows walk around everywhere. Well, cows walk in the streets. <laughs> they walk yeah, everywhere. Yeah, it's so everywhere. So it's, it's not the bull. My no. cow was bulls because bulls. No, it's cows and children. Perpetuate the. You know, no, it's cows and children. So, how do you practice Hinduism when you're not in India? I mean, I know that we can study religion and we can study Hinduism, but how do you practice Hinduism when you're not in India? I mean, I know we can study religion we go to church every week and we have yeah. the readings and the sermon and stuff. Right. But they don't have one God. They don't, mm -hmm. I, I mean, how... That's a great... If, if, if I'm here and I go to Chicago for the weekend, how do I get my Hindu fix for the... I mean, do I have yeah. to... Do, do I, as a Hindu, have to... Do I have a weekly commitment to attend this service? Is there... A big community part. Do yeah. I, how do I find my community? The answer to all of those questions is both yes and no. There are so many. Depends on that's easy. There's so many different ways to be a Hindu. So some some never go to a temple. Some Hindus will never go to a temple. Some will go to a temple regularly. Do they have a priest though that comes to do their rituals with them? Sometimes. Sometimes there is a leader of, of worship and sometimes not. Sometimes they'll. No, no, not in their house. They they might practice their their faith, you know, on, on their own. For some, the practice is meditation. For others, it's it's ritual. For still others, it's you know uh, pilgrimage. There's just so many different ways to be a Hindu. So there's just no. Uh, there's no one way. But there's no. Is there, of course, someone who would want to? Is there a weekly? You know, yes. Is there a yeah, I don't know if there's a Hindu temple in in O'Fallon, but I know there are a couple in the St. Louis area. And they have service times. Uh huh. And you go on Sunday and yeah. Whatever, and when you study, what do you read? Like, you might either meditate. You might meditate. You might pray. And do you send your children to religion? Hindu school. You might you might educate them at home. Yeah, it's, that's the thing about Hindu research, Mark. How, how big is the Hindu population? Oh gosh, I mean, most hundreds, of hundreds, hundreds of millions, even a billion. 
You know, I mean, it is in, it's pretty much in India. Oh, yeah. There are 1.2 billion people in India. They're not all Hindus. There are Sikhs and there are Muslims and whatever, but there are some Christians. Yeah. Here's my interesting question for you. So, um, I practice yoga because it helps with my back. Yes. There are many Catholics, there are many Christians in general that say that Christians should not practice yoga. Yeah. Yes. Because it's not, it's not Christian. Because it's not, it, it brings the devil into your soul. It's yeah. What, because, because I mean, yoga is part of the Brahmin right, where that is one of their forms of meditation. Yes. And by doing the poses, you are asking the gods of the Hindu religion to enter as as we are all one. Yeah, but are you doing that as you do? Yoga? No, I pray a lot. When yeah. I do so yeah, I mean, <laughs> there, there, there are, yeah. aren't they starting Soul Care here, which is a rosary-based yoga program? We have it here already. Yeah. Oh, okay, so oh yeah, there is like there is uh, you know the rosary. One of our rosary yoga. Yeah. Owns the yoga studio in town. Yeah. So there's there's division of opinion, but I would say the majority of yeah. Catholic Christians would say, no, there is no... Because no I've heard that the, that the Pope has said that you cannot do yoga as a Catholic. I don't think this one has. Okay. It may have been the last one. What, what is that other... What's that form of massage? Reiki or something like that? He, I, he said that that was also not allowable. If anybody... It's, it is after 11. If anybody, you know... Has to go. Please, please go. But thank you so much for coming. I really hope this is helpful. But if, if you have more questions, feel free. Did you turn it off? Did you turn it off? <laughs>